Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much for joining once again for the Monks podcast. Hare Krishna Prabhu, the Monks podcast. Yes. Ki jai. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, this is probably the longest series that we have been doing and uh, I had done various yeah. podcasts with different devotees, but I'm pretty grateful that you have been giving your association regularly. And this has become a more and more relishable uh, churning of the Bhagavatam. They're discussing the Shavdharas. Yes. So I think today yes. one of is one of the most uh, beloved avatars in our tradition, apart from say Krishna and maybe Ram. It's yeah. discussed today about Narsimha. So uh, did you have any structure in mind, Maharaj, or should I suggest something and we take it forward? Well, um, one one topic that may be interesting for viewers, listeners, is uh, my own story, you could say, of uh, worship, worshiping Nrsingadev in Germany, oh. and how how we acquired uh, this very uh, special deity of Sri Sri Prahlad Nrsingadev, who is uh, being worshipped very nicely in southeastern Germany. Oh, yes, Maharaj. Please, would you like to share that? And Maharaj, is it okay if I make a few notes while you're speaking? Please, you can make notes. Actually, maybe you could, I didn't have time to do this, but if you go to uh, the website of uh, the German farms, singachalam.de, singachalam day, uh, they should have a gallery of pictures of Nrsingadev. Maybe you can show, um, you know, one or two. So uh, this goes. This this story goes back to 1979. Uh, the devotees in Germany had uh, just acquired a property, a farm, uh, in the southeast part of Germany, uh, about half hour from the city of Passau and about 10 kilometers from the border to what is now Czech Republic. At that time, it was Czechoslovakia. And that border was part of uh, what came to be known as the Iron Curtain. Oh, okay. it, was, it was the big divide between East and West Europe. And more than that, it was the divide between uh, the communist bloc of the USSR and, and the West. And it was that mm, Iron Curtain, which for decades was, you can say, politically dividing the whole world. Yes, I've heard about it. It's almost impen uh, communication across the two parts was very, very difficult. Yeah. So, yeah. so then we were we acquired this property very close to that border. Yes, ma'am. And w w we were thinking. So then there was some discussion. So when we when we move uh, there, hmm. we we already. We're worshiping Shishi Radha Madan Mohan, uh, very beautiful deities now, now worshipped in a um, place called Abenteuer on, in the west part of Germany, of West Germany. Uh, but there was a feeling that since we're going to be in this particular place, we should have also a deity of Nrsingadev. Okay, so because and, of the, the because of the dangerousness of the situation, like we had in uh, Mayapur yeah. after the bandit attacks and something like that, something like sort of like that. Okay, <laughs> uh, but on a different scale. In Mayapur, it was just you know a few local, um, a few local people. 
But uh, here, you know, we were next to an international border, which was, uh, you know, considered a kind of hot, hot place. Not that this was Cold War. There was no war going on, but it was a Cold War. Yes. So the feeling was we should have nursing a day there. And the conclusion was we'll get a very large nursing a deity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And so uh, the head pujari at that time, Ashtarata Prabhu, um, was sent to Germany. <laughs> he, sorry, he was sent to India to make arrangement to have this deity uh, made, especially for Germany. Okay. And so that was, um, yeah, that was that was nineteen. 79 uh, when he was sent. So in those days, to get anything from India, to buy something in India and have it shipped to the West uh, was always, it was always, um, it was always difficult and you always expect that it's going to take a long time before anything you you purchase and ship is going to actually arrive if it will arrive at all. Oh, okay. So that was, yeah, this is uh, 1979, 1980. So uh, Ashtarata Prabhu made arrangement in South India, in Kerala, with one local devotee uh, for the state handicrafts company of Kerala uh, to make this deity. So it was, it was not a ready-made deity. It was a deity to be made specifically for Germany and uh, it would be made of the local granite. So then he made the order, made all the arrangements, came back to Germany and continued with his service of uh, the head Pujari. And everything was going on. And then, to our great surprise, 14 months after uh, Ashrata left Germany to go to India, we had a large, a, a large box delivered to Singachalam, to this uh, place, to the farm. And oh. we were all shocked because 14 months, the deity had not even been made yet. So first they had to make the deity. So we were assuming this is going to take at least two years, maybe three years, who knows, maybe four years, and then maybe the deity will come. But he came in 14 months. Amazing. It was nowhere nearly ready for worship. It was not built yet. Oh, that's amazing. So the deity was moved into one room, which uh, meanwhile, the devotees had uh, asked me to become uh, the pujari for Nrsingadev. So I was thinking, well, then here's the deity. We're going to have to have some ornaments for him. So they moved him into a, one room, which I I turned into a, a small workshop. Uh, because as, as a child, I was all as a child, I was making different things. Uh, I was kind of a handicrafts person. Okay. Uh, so I made a a little a little jewelry workshop, an ornaments workshop and started making ornaments for Nursingadev 
Meanwhile, temple construction was going on, um, meaning renovation. Uh, the, the temple building was originally a barn uh, for a farm that was built in 1917. And the roof was caving in. So we had a good, a good reason um, justifying to replace the roof. So we had permission for doing that. That was easy. That's another story. It's a kind of quite a story, the b building of that temple. So while that was going on, I was making ornaments for the deity. And also I was thinking, but we don't really know anything about how to worship Nusingadev. He's a very special deity. Uh, certainly there must be something different from worshiping Radha Krishna or Gorni Tai. So I got the blessings of the senior devotees to uh, come to India, to South India, to visit Nursinga temples and try if I could interview some of the priests and try to get some specific information how to worship. So I can't. I came first to Hyderabad. And in Hyderabad, I met uh, the late Sampat Kumar Bhattacharya. Sampat Kumar Bhattacharya had been uh, the, the head priest for the installation of Shishi Radha Madan Mohan in the ISKCON temple of, of Hyderabad. And Srila Prabhupada, after the event, had written one thank you letter uh, to Sampat Kumar Bhattacharya. So somehow I found out, found his contact, and I was able to visit him. And he was very kind, very friendly, and he was also, uh, in a nice way, he was quite proud of this uh, letter which he had received from Srila Prabhupada. So he got out the letter and he showed me. <laughs> and, uh, and I explained that I'm on a little mission to learn about Nursinga worship and he was very happy about that. And he immediately started reciting the Sanskrit of some verses from uh, Seventh Canto Bhagavatam. Just spontaneously, he immediately was reciting a few verses. <laughs> so I could understand he is, uh, he is a good person to meet to ask for blessings for this. And I also showed him a photo of our deity with a question, because our deity in Germany is a bit non-standard in terms of uh, standard nursing uh, iconography, because he has Prahlad on his lap on his left knee. And standard iconography would say, oh no, this you you this is not proper. You must have, there must be Lakshmi on on Nursingadev's left knee. Okay. Somehow or other, I don't know how it came this deity with Prahlad on Nursingadev's left knee. <laughs> And some, someone had raised, when we were still in Germany, someone had raised this question and there was some concern that are we going to be worshiping a, a deity that's, uh, the iconography is wrong, is not proper. 
So I had this photo I, I showed to Sampad Kumar Bhattacharya, and I asked him, do you think this is a problem? And he looked, and he, he was silent for a few moments, and he said, hmm, unusual. <laughs> oh, okay. And then I said, so does this mean there's a problem? And he said, no, no problem, just unusual. <laughs> That's interesting, okay. <laughs> so Maharaj, is this the same person you have mentioned in your book, uh, the Bhagavatam, where you said that uh, your essays on the Bhagavatam is the first book with Ravi Radhika Raman Prabhu, where you are written on the seventh canto. You said you stayed, oh, with, yes. we stayed with a Sri Vaishnava scholar. And you yes, saw that's his... him. Oh, okay. That's that's one of the most <laughs> beautiful essays of the uh, essays on the seventh can on the seventh canton that's some Halila that I have ever read. You know, the way you have analyzed oh, thank and you. kind of insights that are there. So yeah. Thank you for sharing this, Maharaj. So, so I I spent the next few weeks uh, traveling around uh, Andhra, Andhra Pradesh, because that's where most of the Nasinga deities are. Yes, and um, it's an interesting question. Maybe some historians could give answer, but why specifically Andhra is a place of Nrsinga? Yeah, you know, that way. Somehow, you know, like in Maharashtra, Ganesh worship has become very big, yeah. or in. Bengal Kali worship has become somewhat Durga or Kali worship has become big. Yeah. I don't know. There could be transcendental reasons. There could be historical reasons. Or mm. yeah, of course, a Hovilam is in Andhra. Yes, that is true. Uh, mm, and uh, Singachalam, the original Singachalam, is in Andhra. There's quite a few temples. There's one place just north of Hyderabad called Yadgiri Guta. Uh, it's a Lakshmi Nursinga temple. Yeah. Anyway, yes, Nursinga Dev is big in Andhra, that we can say. Yes, Maharaj, that is true, no doubt. So I was thinking about uh, Narsimha Dev as compared to the other avatars. So mm. one of the things which struck me is that uh, in maybe not always, but say usually whenever the Lord descends, the odds seem to be against him. Say Ram is a mortal, at least he's considered to be a mortal to ordinary vision. And Ravan is a powerful Rakshasa with various genetics on his part. But in physical size as well as form, it seems Narsimha Dev is usually seen to be much bigger than Hiranyakashipu. Though, of course, Narsimha Dev's devotee Prahalad is much smaller than Hiranyakashipu. So, in that yes. sense, uh, Lord Narsimha Dev's role as the protector. So, although all the avatars protect, protect generally most of the avatars they come to protect in particular ways. Yes. But Narsimha Dev, in a very, you could say, visually vivid way, does look like a very reassuring protector. <laughs> yes. <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, please. Especially uh, because Nrsinghe, in terms of iconography, he, he takes several, there are several forms of Nrsinghe. And it is, uh, it's said that the form of Nrsinghe that we have in Shida Mayapur, I think they call them Stala, Stala Nrsinghe, is the most fearsome, the most angry form. Uh, this oh. is, he's more angry in this form than his Ugra form, which is with Hiranyakashipu stretched across his uh, lap and he's, you know, tearing him apart. Um, and the opposite extreme we have in Germany is Prahlad Nrsinghe. He's completely passive, pacified, peaceful, and therefore Prahlad is sitting peacefully on his lap. And then there's some other forms in between. 
Oh, okay. So I I had always thought that the form in Mayapur which we have is Ugra, because we often chant no. that Ugram Viram Mahavishnu. No, he's even more angry than Ugra Nursinga. Oh, okay. <laughs> So the prayer he's is just more... he's in the mood of he's just come out of the uh the pillar yeah and he's i mean we don't we can't say that the lord becomes blind with anger but it's like he's blind with anger yeah where is that rascal <laughs> <laughs> whereas ugra nasinga he's already caught he's fought with him he's caught with him He's on his lap, and now, and Hiranyakashipu has been, has just been killed, or he's being killed. So of course he's also very angry then. But it's, I don't remember uh, where this came from. But this Stalin nursing is even more angry. Oh, that's amazing, and uh, so. If we consider almost all the avatars, their uh, actions are quite dramatic. But Narsimhadev's whole appearance and pastime, bursting out of a pillar, and in a form like a, a form of a half man, half lion, that is is very dramatic. And uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, you mentioned about Andhra. I have seen that in the. in the telugu movies they have made some very beautiful movies of narasimha but whereas mahabharat oh. and ramayan have been depicted in english in animation and various forms i don't think narasimha dev has been rendered like that so much in hmm. anything in the mainstream media till now hmm i i that i wouldn't know yeah um yeah. but of course that there's there's another reason that narasimha may not be appearing in the media uh such media so much and that is that narsingadev himself appears for a very short time yes it's sometimes said of all the avatars his appearance is the most brief he comes suddenly out of the pillar he, he has a uh, a very short fight with hirani kashipu in contrast with varaha dev who fights for quite some time with hiranyaksha so oh. much that the the demigods complain you know to to varaha dev please finish him off it's been too long now okay. but narsingadev narsingadev plays with hiranyakashipu a little bit but then fairly quickly he finishes him off then comes the from the bhagavatam version the prayers of the demigods then the prayers of prahlad uh and then he's gone <laughs> yeah but then we have a sort of um epilog according to uh the understanding in navadvipam that he he visits nasingapalli oh. on his way back to vaikuntha he makes a stop in nasingapalli because the demigods have prayed to him please before you go can we please worship you <laughs> so okay. they so that's the that's the past time in nasingapalli in navadvipta yeah. that's true now um, if i look at the narsimha puran version of the of the uh, narsimha leela also and the bhagavatam version the bhagavatam version bhagavatam starts with a particular focus that is uh, you know why is is god equal or not and mm -hmm. uh, in your essay i got one of the most endearing explanations of this how ultimately the lord places both prahlad and uh, hiranyakashipu on his lap in that sense he is equal to both of them but because so their yeah. their position in a sense is the same but because their disposition is different so the lord's disposition that toward them also is different yes so the way he treats there's them. there's there's another element here i think 
I don't remember if I mentioned that in the in that article. Uh, as you said, the question is uh, whether God is equal to all. And this whole episode, which takes, um, what, two thirds of the seventh canto is yes. there to answer, to answer this question. But I've always wondered, does it really answer the question? And I came to this conclusion that it does answer this question, but not in the way you would expect. And the way it answers is the one who is equal to everyone in the Bhagavatam's version very much emphasized. Who is, who is being equal to everyone? It's Prahlad. And oh, Nrsingadev comes to protect the one who's, who is equal to everyone. And in that way, the Lord is equal to everyone. Does that make sense? Sorry. So you're saying that the devotee, Prahlad, is equal to everyone and the Lord protects the yeah. one who is equal to everyone. Right. That's fascinating. And in that way, the Lord demonstrates his equality. He is equal to everyone, but how he is equal to everyone is he protects, he protects those who are equal to everyone. Yes. In this way, he is partial to those who protect, sorry, he's partial to those who are equal to everyone. <laughs> okay, that's true. <laughs> so in a sense, we could say the equality is uh, not so much like a literal equality as an equal reciprocity. Now he's reciprocating with everyone equally. If somebody takes a step toward them, he toward him, he takes a step toward them. And uh, Yeah, that's another way of understanding, of course. Yeah. <laughs> And yes. In a sense, if you really want to relate with a person, a stone-like equality would not make them particularly attractive. We might just appreciate how stoic somebody is, but that doesn't right. necessarily make them very lovable. It also doesn't make for much of a story to tell. Yeah, <laughs> that is also true. <laughs> yeah. So, but but yeah. Prahlad being equal to everyone is a big disturbance for Hiranyakashipu. And then we have a story because Hiranyakashipu wants to destroy uh, that spirit of equal vision. Uh, and so, so we have mm. the conflict which makes for drama, which makes for a story. So we could also say that the the Lord is equal because the Lord inspires Prahalad to become to stay equal, to have that equal disposition. It is because of his devotion yeah. that he is equal. So yes. And and that um yeah, his basis for uh for equal vision, of course, is his devotion to the Lord. Mm. And that devotion to the Lord, he has been infused in him from Narada, who is equal, uh, has equal vision, such that he is able to uh, give shelter to Hiranyakashipu's wife, Kayadhu, because all the demigods are thinking, oh, um, you know, there's, there's a demon in, in her womb. <clears throat> but uh, Narada saw otherwise, and therefore, uh, Prahlad was able to benefit from Narada's association. That's an amazing insight. So the spiritual master's qualities come about in the disciple. And I was thinking about Prahlad also. Both ways, during his, it's described about his equality. It is when he's receiving teachings from Shanda Amarka, it is said that he's thinking internally that 
all this differentiation between these are demons and the, these are the they, the demons are teaching him that these are the asura these are the devatas they are our enemies he he doesn't accept that and then later on in his when he is ex- humbly giving some wisdom to hiranyakashipu at that time he says the only reason you see you see anybody as your enemy is because of your mind which is actually your enemy yeah <laughs> so it's amazing so there this is uh, so many places uh, so many uh, what do you say so many pieces are falling in place since you talk yeah. about this point about prahlad being the actual uh, actually equal actually equal to everyone <laughs> yeah so. no in many ways the if we think of uh, the bhagavatam version of uh, the the whole leela as uh if we notice the dramatic aspect of it then uh i think one could argue that the hero of this story is prolad yes he, and in a sense is, he, he is yeah, um, well his his quality uh shines through everything and it's it's that uh or his all of his qualities are shining through in such a way that um they 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 are highlighted or they are put into sharp uh relief by hiranyakashipu um uh, being so terrible and by the way speaking of hiranyakashipu Uh, in one of his writings shila bhakti siddhanta sarasati takur says um, that we should appreciate hiranyakashipu uh, because without his appearance there would be no appearance of nrsinghadev yeah <laughs> that's beautiful and his father of course shila bhakti vinod uh, takur uh, as Uh, many know uh, installed a deity of lakshmi nrsingha um which is there at uh, at yoga peet and devotees may wonder why would he install nrsingha dev i think the answer comes in his uh poem his bengali poem navadipa bhava taranga in which he mentions uh nrsingha dev that <clears throat> by worshiping nrsingha maybe he mentions lakshmi nrsingha i don't remember by worshiping nrsingha dev we we worship nrsingha dev to purify the heart so that radha and krishna can take their place in our heart oh okay so so he gives a a kind of one might say a functional identity to uh to or functional basis for for the worship of nrsinghade we worship him to purify the heart and of course in the bhagavatam uh there's this verse in the fifth canto devotees like to chant um chapter 18 verse 8 i think it is om namo bhagavate narasinghaya namaste jaste jase avira vir bhava vajranaka vajadangscha karmashayan randhaya randhaya tamo grasa grasa om swaha abhayam abhayam atmani bhuvishta om shram yes thank you this is one of beautiful verses so this verse is saying karma shayan randhaya please remove um if i remember ram randhaya randhaya kind yeah, karma ashayan 
my desire for fruit of activity. Yes. Demonic desires to be happy by material activities. Uh, kindly vanquish these. So devotees like to chant this because I, I understand it this way. This is uh, realizing Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's uh, message, his, his why we worship Nasingadev is to purify the heart so that oh, Radha yeah. Krishna can uh, take their place in the heart. And the next verse immediately after this, uh, verse number nine is, it's really my favorite. I think it describes. Um, yeah, let, every, the let the whole universe be peaceful. This is a beautiful verse. Yeah, this is a perfect, this is the attitude that we aspire for such that Shri Shri Radha Krishna will take place in, in our hearts. Svastyas tu vishvasya kala prasidatam dhyayantu bhutani shivam mito dhyaya manas chabadram bhajatadat hoksha jaya veshyatam no matir apyahai tuki. Um, if you can scroll down, we can read yeah. the translation. Yes. May there be good fortune throughout the universe and may all envious persons be pacified. May all living entities become calm by practicing bhakti yoga for by accepting devotional service, they will think of each other's, they will think of each other's welfare. Therefore, let us all engage in the service of the Supreme Transcendence, Lord Sri Krishna, and always remain absorbed in thought of him. So this is such a powerful prayer of Prahlad. This is Prahlad uh, offering prayers in, uh, what is it? Kim Purusha Varsha, or one, yes. of the, one of the Varshas. Yeah. You know, I never thought of this word specifically in terms of making our heart receptive for Krishna. I, I used to think of this verse more in terms of bringing peace in the world, bringing peace mm -hmm. in the outer world. But it's at one level true that only when we have peace in the inner world, then there will be peace in the outer world also. And then yeah. if there's peace in the inner world, we can have uh, Krishna manifest there. Now, while you're speaking this, I have been recently looking at the Bhagavad Gita and where all Krishna talks about virtues and in what context. So mm -hmm. it struck me for the first time that in the 12th chapter, when Krishna talks about uh, the qualities of a devotee, 12, 13 to 20. So he talks about a devotee having virtues and such a virtues, virtuous devotee is dear to me. So that is, he's not talking anything about a devotional activities over there. A person who chants mm. my holy names or worships my deities or studies the scriptures, that is there. Yeah. But what Krishna is saying is a devotee who is Advaishta Sarabhutana, Maitra Karuna Evacha, who is non envious friend of everyone, who is equipoised, yeah. who is not disturbed by others, who doesn't disturb others, who is firm. Yeah. So those are all virtues which endear, endear a person to Krishna, endear a devotee to Krishna. So in that, yes. uh, that can also be correlated here that. When Lord Narasimha Dev cleanses our hearts, then the soul's virtues start manifesting and that, that endears the devotee to Krishna. So in that sense, the heart is prepared for Krishna. Because these devotees are dear to the Lord because mm. of their qualities, the Lord wants to reciprocate. He wants to fulfill the devotee's desire. Mm. And the devotee's desire is very a nice, very nice model of what a devotee desires uh, is this prayer of Prahlad. Svastyasta Vishvasya Kala Prasidatam. Let there be uh, peace throughout the universe, however it goes. Uh, let everyone practice bhakti yoga. Um, 
for in this way everyone will become free from envy, something like that. So in other words, the devotee hears, sorry, the Lord hears that prayer and because the devotee's prayer is dear to the Lord, the Lord feels inclined to realize that prayer, to make it possible for that to happen. Okay, yeah. yeah I read once in a Vyasuja offering of Srila Prabhupada, where one of the devotees was saying that, that you know, because Prabhupada had such a great desire to share Krishna consciousness all over the world. So this devotee, of course, was saying out of his humility that Prabhupada used all of us, the Krishna used all of us, although we were not qualified to spread Krishna consciousness so that Prabhupada's desire could be fulfilled. So, right. That's, <laughs> that's something similar. Yeah. Now, um, going back to this point of, you said about Prahalad's equality manifesting as, 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 as the answer to that question. Now, Prahalad's equality also is seen uh, in the sense that he desires the deliverance of everyone, including his father. And then it is said yes. that his father is delivered even without his asking. That's what Prahla tells him. So yeah. now that Trisapta Pita Puta, it's, uh, that you know, 21 generations are delivered. Now, often this question comes up, what does it, is it literal? Can people be, can somebody be delivered even if they don't want to be delivered? Or is it like <laughs> the doors to deliverance open for them? And then it's up to them to walk through. How do we understand that statement? That's also something that has made me wonder. <laughs> so I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna have the magic answer to that. One way to understand it, I believe, is perhaps uh, the most mundane way of understanding, and that is in terms of reputation. We all have that sense that when, when someone does something extraordinary, mm -hmm. we all have a sense that that person's relatives are also somehow extraordinary, or they must be extraordinary. Okay. Uh, cert certainly the parents are special for having uh, had this particular child even in the most mundane sense, if some uh, sports person, you know, does mm. some outstanding sports performance, then, uh, you know, they'll go interview the, per the person's parents. And, and then if that person has children, somehow they are special also. Um, so there's... Uh, the, this goes back to the importance, I think, in traditional culture of reputation. And this points us back to uh, Krishna's warning to Arjuna in the third, in the second chapter, uh, okay. that yeah. if you don't, if you don't fight in this war, Avacha varangs cha bahun varishanti. The the people. What are people going to say? <laughs> that your reputation will be finished. Hmm. And he says, and this uh, to lose your reputation would be worse than death. To lose your reputation would be worse than death. True. Yeah. Of course, this is a kind of standard, this is kind of a standard understanding in uh, what we may call kshatriya culture. And we see it also in ancient, ancient Greek uh, literature, the Iliad, you know, the war of Troy. It was all about gaining glory. Glory yeah. meant that uh, even getting killed on the battlefield is can be a very good thing because then uh, you will live forever 
in everyone's memory as a glorious warrior. Yeah, it's true. You no, know, I sometimes uh, I initially when I read that I found it uh, a little strange that so much personal rem- reputation. But even in the in the Dhru Maharaj pastime, uh, when Prahl, uh, when Narad Muni comes to know how Dhru has left for the far forest, he actually appreciates and he says, "Ahok Shatriya Tejasam Man Bhangam Amrushyatam." Just see how great are the Shatriyas that they cannot tolerate dishonor. So this seemed radically in contrast with our idea that we we should always be tolerant like a tree. Uh, <laughs> but then it struck me that sometimes. the sense of honor makes a person behave honorably so yeah and then i read a letter of prabhupad where it seemed that uh, one devotee had had failed in following some regulative principles and prabhupad had written that letter you know you took vows in front of the dts in front of the sacred fire how can you break those vows don't you have a sense of honor so that was what struck me that a sense of honor is not necessarily something like ego or pride it is maybe the sense by which we ensure that we behave respectably not mm. just that we yeah. seek respect from others so there are two different aspects to this that one is pride could be more of a, a craving respect from others whereas mm. a sense of honor could be more of we behaving honorably or respectably yes and uh the sense of honor is <clears throat> excuse me it's it's a very it's a very public uh virtue uh it has to do with reputation and you can say the op- what is the opposite of honor it's shame and shame is that's nobody is ashamed in isolation they're ashamed in the context of how others will be seeing them uh and in what are called shame cultures it's and this gets back to the 21 generations uh the opposite of honor and glory uh and maybe 21 generations of honor is um perhaps 21 generations of of shame <laughs> for doing something shameful <laughs> that's beautiful that's so true that actually we don't uh, contrast honor with humility so the opposite of we say we could pride or arrogance we could say is humility but the opposite of mm-hmm. pride of honor is is if you could say dishonor it's more of shame then so that's very different and yeah. i think through the, by considering the antonyms of these two words the 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 difference between the two concepts also becomes much clearer yeah so if i am then then is a when you said shame is usually experienced in isolation so not I, in isolation yeah no i'm saying the opposite it's not so, experienced sorry, in shame isolation shame is you use shame is usually not experienced in isolation so can we say contrast shame with guilt that if if i do something wrong and my conscience tells me that it's not wrong then would you call that as guilt or is guilt also experienced in in relation itself yeah i think guilt is uh, more of a private sense and uh, i mentioned shame cultures that one speaks i don't know um anthropo- anthropologists i guess speak of shame cultures and uh guilt cultures and uh the sort of paradigmatic guilt culture is uh in uh the abrahamic traditions especially in judaism um you know not following the the command of god then one is guilty but in shame cultures which i think are generally eastern uh east asian south asian the concern is uh what is the effect of one's behavior on uh on one's family so that's a shame 
that's a very gross explanation. It's probably yeah, <laughs> no, but much it's a, more refined. No, but it's an important uh, differentiation. Yeah. Now, interesting you mentioned about Judaism. I thought it was uh, it was Catholicism which had more of a emphasis on shame or rather on guilt and original sin and confession. Does Judaism also have? I don't think Judaism has the idea of a weekly confession or anything like that. Uh, that's true. Uh, I don't know the Jewish <clears throat> the Jewish tradition as contrasted with Christianity, uh, it's very much emphasizing rules, following of the injunctions. Yes. We would say, you know, we would say the vidhi of Shastra. They have what are called the mitzvot. Uh, there's something over 600 different rules. If one's a very strict Orthodox Jew, uh, one is following some 600 and something uh, rules and regulations. Oh, okay. And, and perhaps the idea of guilt uh, has to do with not following those. Mm. But I think the bigger issue in, one of the bigger issues in ancient Israel was um, being, whether one was loyal or disloyal uh, to, to the covenant uh, of Yahweh. In yeah. other words there was always this problem. This is kind of the ongoing story in the Hebrew Bible of um, being obedient to God's covenant, his set of rules. First, it was the Ten Commandments, and then eventually 600. <laughs> uh, one is turning to other gods, and this, uh, this disloyalty was, I'm mentioning this in a book, which I've just finished the manuscript of, about our deity worship tradition. The idea of idolatry in Judaism is one of the ideas is, uh, the oldest of them, is uh, being not faithful to God was um, by worshiping other gods was considered to be uh, similar to or the same or as bad as adultery. And in ancient Israel, adultery could be punishable by death. By yes. So it was that's, very, that's striking. very so, curious so. thing. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in that sense, not worry, that that sense of other gods worshiping other gods is not just uh, bad or wrong, but it's it's as sinful as as adultery. So that sense is not yeah. there at all in the Bhagavad Gita. Say when it talks about Anya Devata, Krishna doesn't yeah, approve of Krishna them, but says, it is it is very it is very different connotation. Krishna yeah, says this is for different. less intelligent people. He's not saying for immoral people. Right. Yeah. So that brings in here how also that there are all the other devatas present in the Narsimhalila also. And coming back to that topic, that yes. they all, at sometimes the other devatas may work at cross purposes with the Supreme Lord because of either their own uh, their own illusion or because of say the pressure of the situation. Mm, say like. Sometimes Indra starts challenging Krishna, as in Govardhan Leela, or in this case because of fear of the demons. But it's not that inherently they are against the Lord. So right. that, that brings out also the contrast between Prahlad's prayers and say Indra's prayers. Indra's prayers, if you paraphrase it, he's saying that, my dear Lord, now you have freed us from the terror of Hiranyakashipu. Now we can worship you, we can worship you properly. Our worship has been interrupted, now we can resume it. But yes. Prahlad says, I was never afraid. You know, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of anything except forgetting you or except, uh, except being <laughs> caught in material existence. And his worship was never interrupted. So it's more yeah. of pure worship and impure worship rather than, rather than say like 
were devotion being moral and devotion to some other gods being immoral so it's yes a, it's, it's interesting that in chapter 2 uh seventh canto chapter 2 i think it is uh the the demigods are pressured into serving and also worshiping hiranyakashipu yeah uh, including it says also narada was drafted into this that's interesting it, uh, uh, my understanding of that is sometimes when the i would like to hear your understanding also but my understanding was that sometimes when the uh, when a particular illa is meant to highlight the glory of a particular devotee then all other characters are shown in a light which glorifies that devotee it's like even even yeah. lakshmi devi she is afraid of narasimha devi it is said but prahlad is not afraid so right. so in that sense that past time could it be seen narad muni's behavior also in that mood of highlighting uh, prahlad's glory yeah that's a, i think a nice a nice explanation but it's also you know i like to always always point out the humor in the bhagavatam and uh there's some humor here as well um humor, when okay. we picture yeah when we picture the scene you know imagine you walk into the court of hiranyakashipu and you see the various courtiers offering praise to hiranyakashipu and then you look over to one side and you see uh narada muni is there and he's also offering praise you're going to you're going to think what <laughs> 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 what is going on and then maybe in my mind i see narada looking back at at you as you look at him you know in a surprised expression he looks back at you and gives you a quick wink <laughs> indicate that you know he's this is just uh, i just ha- i have to do this sorry <laughs> i i'm not i'm not doing this seriously but i have to <clears throat> amazing <laughs> you know this aspect of the humor within scripture is sometimes unless, i never really been able to connect with that but sometimes when some uh, devotees narrate the past times in a very humorous way i sometimes wonder whether they are actually accurately representing the past time but the way you are bringing it out it is there is a certain amount of uh, humor inherent there yeah it's certainly there's no tragedy in the in the bhagavatam what do you mean no tragedy um well tragedy requires that there be uh the finality of death as i see it that is in classical terms tragedy means there's okay. uh there's death meaning somebody is really killed and that's it they're finished and we don't find that in the well the puranic literature at all uh there's some discussion scholarly discussion about mahabharata uh there's one figure in the mahabharata who is considered to be a tragic figure and that is uh karna karna yes karna is is a uh, in a sort of classical way he is we can say tragic although of course no one really dies we understand but in the in the in the mahabharata in within the frame of the mahabharata you can say uh, there is a kind of tragic sense but as far as uh, the the whole bhagavatam of course it's very clear excuse me i just have to turn this off uh it's very clear that the soul is eternal that's one of the central messages uh and so when hiranyakashipu is killed we know he's not actually killed 
He's just moving on to his next program, which is he's going to become Ravana and so on. And since there's, no, I guess what I want to say is since there's no tragedy as such mm. in, in literary terms, um, what are we left with? We're left with comedy. Oh, okay. Now you could say, well, there's also pathos. Pathos is, um, I don't know, what is pathos? Sort of sad feelings, something like that. But we don't seem, we, we don't really find that um, in the Bhagavatam either. So even though Parishit Maharaj is cursed to die and eventually he dies, but the Bhagavatam's thrust is that by the power of sound, he is elevated and he attains uh, spiritual liberation. So in that sense, it's not a tragedy. Right. The same he's, way with everyone. he's a big success story. He's, he's, a, he's the ideal listener to the Bhagavatam and he attains perfection it's said that he uh, attains perfection before his body is killed. Oh, okay. That's uh, so. It's uh, so. Then, if death is not final, then would is tragedy even conceptually possible? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we could say from this life's perspective, uh, at one level, everybody's life is going to end in a tragedy. Because Well, is that tragedy or is it path, path or is it pathos? So I is was it... just look, looking at pathos, uh, and... a quality that evokes pity or sadness. That's a yeah. straightforward meaning. And we have the English word pathetic. And there are descriptions in the Bhagavatam of different kinds of death. Uh, there's a kind of spectrum that runs from the most pathetic uh, to the most heroic. I would say it's not pathetic to dramatic or to tragic but, uh, or anything, but it's pathetic to heroic. So Parikshit Maharaj's death is heroic. Uh, Bhishma Dev's death is heroic. Um, Sati's death is heroic. And then, and then Kapila describes the pathetic death in his instruction to uh, Devahuti. And Ajamila's death is almost pathetic and just at the last minute, inadvertently, uh, it becomes, I don't know if you can say heroic, but somehow he, he slips through <laughs> and becomes a successful bhakta to yeah. glorify the holy name, of course. Uh, the What's glorious there is the holy name. So we could say there in that case, uh, the real tragedy would be if somebody deliberately turns away from the Lord and then their death becomes, again, it would not be tragic, it would be more pathetic. Because say somebody yeah. waste, we, yeah, so somebody is wasting human life. We have Bhakti Vinod Thakur's songs when he takes the role of a conditioned soul. I wasted my life. Yeah. So that's more of yeah, I can it's more of pathos than tragedy. It's pathos and the person is to be pitied. We we say, oh, this is very pitiful uh, if oh, someone okay. wastes wastes the human form of life. So yeah, now I can understand when you're saying about tragedy, there is a sense of irreversible finality to it, which will never be there. Yeah. Greek tragedy, Shakespearean tragedy, uh, when you watch or hear them or read, 
uh, you really get a sense, oh, this is really, this is really tragic. <laughs> even, even the romantic story, Romeo and Juliet, uh, you know, it's a, it's a romance, but it ends uh, in, tra in tragedy. They, they both end up uh, dead. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, so, and if you see, uh, I once saw a professional performance of Rome, Romeo and Juliet live uh, in uh, uh, Stratford-on-Avon, in the in the place in England, um, when you get pro real professional actors, it's very powerful. And then you see, then you understand what is what is you have a real sense of of tragedy. But then you step back and you think, well, actually, no, the soul is eternal, so they didn't actually die. That kind of spoils <laughs> spoils the story. <laughs> okay. So, is there is a like a is tra tra tragedy one of the rasas? Twelve rasas? I don't mm, think so. No, no, no. There is horror. There is fear. Mm. There is amazement, adbhuta. So, yeah, that's a beautiful point. So, there is no tragedy at all. Mm. So. So in a sense, even if something but bad that's, happens, sorry. Well, that is interesting because somehow um, it's it's certainly not one of the twelve rasas of Shilarupa Goswami, and we don't find it in any of the other um, analyses of Indian aesthetics. But uh, we do see that. Um, to watch a dramatic performance is relishable. Uh, I'm saying a dramatic, tragic performance. It's very relishable. So why is that? That's interesting. Something to think about. <laughs> of course, you mentioned horror. Horror, we, people like horror movies. You go to the movie, you know it's going to be scary, <laughs> but yeah. you enjoy that. You you relish it. You enjoy it. What what is the, what is going on there? <laughs> no, one, one way to understand it is that, as you said, there is, a, you know, the human heart experiences various emotions, and uh, whatever the heart is capable of experiencing the originality of that will be in relationship with Krishna. So Yashoda Mai, when say, for example, she sees uh, Krishna being uh, carried up high in the sky by Trunavarth, she experiences some kind of horror. And mm. uh, there is a relish in any emotional relationship with Krishna. So we could say there is a relish in terms of, there is a drop of that experience in this world also whenever we experience something. Similar, mm. although it's because it's not connected with Krishna, so it's almost like a drop as compared to ocean. But uh, mm. <laughs> it is, uh, I mean, horror movies are also a big genre. And oh, yeah, nowadays, somehow they have come like all these vam vampire movies come up, and it's like horror and romance are combined together at times, <laughs> <laughs> which is, is quite. Uh, uh, bewildering at times, at least it looks strange at times initially, at least. Yes. So, I'm just looking. Hmm. Uh, I'm just looking at uh, chapter eight of the Bhagavatam when Nrsingadeva appears. And there's something interesting. Um, verse number 17. It says, the form was neither that of a man nor that of a lion. Stambe, Savayam, Na Mrigam, Namanusham. Now, the first thing that is interesting is the word Mrigam just means animal. 
And specifically, it means wild animal, as opposed to tame, uh, uh, tame or domesticated, which would be pashu. And then in the next verse, it says, Aho kim etan nre mrigendra rupam. Okay. Aho kim etan mrigendra rupam. Okay. That's the last line of the next verse. Um, <clears throat> that wonderful form. Oh, sorry. Going back uh, to the third line. Nayam rigo na api naraha vichitram could not discern is either a man or a lion emerging from the pillar. So this double negative, he's not a man, he's not a wild animal. But then in the last line, a ho kim etan. Nri Mrigendra Rupam, he's wondering, Hiranyakashipu wonders, what is this creature that is half man and half lion? Now it says Mriga Indra, which would indicate uh, would indicate a lion, uh, the yes. the king of the beasts. Although technically you could say mm, uh, that Indra applies both to Nri and to Mriga, but generally it would mean mr applying to Mriga. So, so he sees this form, which uh, is neither a man nor an animal. <laughs> and of course we can say, well, yeah, that's because he isn't either a man or an animal. He is uh, the Supreme Lord. Hmm. So are you saying that this is an experience of a rasa? Or, I mean, I'm not understanding, oh, vichitram, vichitram aho ki metan? So are this well, the rasa here seems to, uh, the dominant rasa seems to be, vit, yes, chitra, wonder. Wonder, yeah. Um, and, and this is in the translation, Prabhupada says, Hiranyakashipu wondered. <laughs> Now, there's yes. different sorts of wondering. There's, you know, sort of, hmm, I wonder, what is this? And then there's a deeper sort of astonishment and, you know, profound sort of existential wonder. Oh, okay. You could say there's wonder and wonder struck. You know, so I wonder means I just think it's like a curious question. But wonder struck yeah. is more like overwhelmed by astonishment. Or overwhelmed yeah. by amazement. Yeah. So the word Adbhuta comes quite often in the in our literature, in the Bhagavad Gita also. Adbhuta comes in the in the in the relationship with the Virat Rupa and Sanjay's both yeah. Arjuna's contemplation observation as well as Sanjay's contemplation. So, yeah. so in terms of since we have gone in this direction, maybe we could uh, Conclude with this part of the Rasik analysis of, say, of Nardana Simhadev's Leela. So earlier you mentioned that he's our protector on the path of our bhakti. But so while we experience the Rasa in terms of in our relationship with Krishna, but there are various Rasas we experience in the Narsimha Leela also. So there is maybe fear at the atrocity of Hiranyakashipu, but there is wonder at the fearlessness of, uh, of Prahalad. Mm. And then there is again, uh, here wonder as it is said in Narsimhadev appears. Probably this is, you know, in movies they talk about dramatic entries. This is one of the most mm. dramatic entries coming up, bursting out <laughs> of a pillar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, there's another rasa which um, I won't be able to say where, which purport, but Prabhupada mentions in one purport in the seventh canto that Vatsalya rasa mm -hmm. can be in two directions. We usually think of it as 
uh, the devotee regarding the Lord as the dependent, as the child. Yeah. But it can be the other way around as well. In this case, Prahlad is the child who is dependent on the Lord. And that, Prabhupada said, can also be considered vatsalya, vatsalya rasa. That's interesting. We usually talk about vatsalya rasa in inversion of, say, the, the normal conception of God as the father and the and the uh, worshipper as the child or father, like in the Christian tradition of father thou art in heaven. But it seems that uh, that is a relationship with uh, like a significant level of distance. Whereas a Prahlad Narasimha seems to be a much more intimate kind of relationship. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, even Arjuna says that uh, Piteva putra se sakheva sakhyu priyam priyaya marasi deva sodhum. That just as a lover forgives a beloved, as a friend forgives a friend, or as a, as a father forgives a son, you please mm. forgive whatever inappropriate behavior I had. So, yes, as, as I was uh, hanging out with you and joking. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bad word for that. <laughs> Normally, we don't use it with God, but that's exactly what Arjuna was doing. Yeah, he was hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the devtas, when uh, they see Narasimha Dev, so there is Adrushth Purvam, like there is that mood that he has never been seen before. So, mm. there is. Uh, uh, when we say that the Lord was never seen before, is Narasimha Dev also an avatar who appears in every yuga, but the devtas have no awareness of his appearance from a previous yuga? Any idea how it is like that? Well, the, the term could also be used in a rhetorical sense. Okay. Uh, I, I would say... Uh, never before, yeah, literally not seen form doesn't mean never at any time um, in the past, unless it says, does it say a purva, a drishtam? I don't know which Adrishta verse purva. it is. Okay. Uh, oh, a drishta purvam. I'm just saying. Adrishtyat, no, it is Adrishtyat Atyadbhutam Rupam. There's no Purvam. Adrishta Purvam is in the uh, description of the Vishwarupa in the Bhagavad Gita. I don't right. think that's here. Okay. Right. So it could be rhetorical. So then, yeah. we, sol so then we solved that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. But certainly he was a great shock, <laughs> the appearance of Nrsingade. <laughs> And that's the other element of humor I wanted to mention is that Hiranyakashipu uh, really tried hard to uh, get a contract with Lord Brahma uh, without any loopholes so that he could be yeah. uh, eternal, that he would be indestructible. And it really seemed that his contract was good. It was. It covered everything. No animal, no human, um, not the day or the night, not, um, not inside, not outside, and so on. Seemed like it was covering everything. Mm. And then Nrsinghadev's humor is, uh, his joke, so to say, is uh, to honor all of those conditions and still appear and kill Hirani Kajpu without breaking any of the uh, conditions. That's humorous, I think. Yeah. That's his, I uh, In fact, one of the... That's his joking. That's true. One of the major things when humor comes is when somebody outwits somebody else. No? Yeah. So person A thinks I'm very clever and then person B tries to shows how 
their cleverness still has hold so the, this is yes you know he tries all possible ways and the lord outwits him so and i find it also kind of humorous that after everything is over um uh, isn't it nrsingadev speaks to lord brahma and says something like you know just don't be giving such benedictions please trouble some benedictions yeah <laughs> stop giving such benedictions i have to work really hard to figure out how to get around them <laughs> that's true and it seems this narsimhadev leela is probably among the most prominent leelas but there are other demons also who uh, make some certain conditions and the lord lord somehow creatively finds a way to overpower them yeah yeah this is his fun one one way that he has fun yeah and of course uh the lord has made the whole arrangement in vaikuntha uh, because he wants to have some fun he wants to fight uh and in order to do that he has to have some demons uh and to make it a little extra interesting because he could have made hiranyakashipu uh just be similar to hiranyaksha hiranyaksha was very kind of straightforward you know looking for a good fight and varaha dev gives him the good fight with hiranyakashipu he was more clever in making all these uh conditions so that just added a some a little more spice for the lord to give him opportunity to um fulfill all of the conditions and and still tear apart hiranyakashipu uh, so you could say that the the creativity or the effort in the case of hiran and narsimhadev is more in the form in which he appears than what he does in the form whereas in the case of varahadev mm. he appears in a in a ordinary seeming form but then he, he the excitement is more in the action that he does whereas here the excitement is simply the form in which he appears itself yes but there's one element of narsingadev's action which i find especially striking and one could say is also humorous in an ironic way and that is uh, he uh he tears open hiranyakashipu's gut and what does he do he takes out his intestines and what does he do with the intestines makes it into a garland yeah garland he makes it into a garland and he garlands himself <laughs> and it's almost like okay uh hiranyakashipu you actually wanted to serve me um by offering me a nice garland so i'm going to help you here <laughs> <laughs> oh god you know i ne- i never thought of that being like a offering of hiranyakashipu i thought of more i'd heard uh, that it is from this intestine that uh, prahlad came so i'm garlanding myself but we could also see it this way that i said lord accepted putana's service although yeah. she what she was offering him poison and he said that's beautiful so so that means even within the within the so if once we get beyond the uh like i was talking about this vampire romance peculiar combination so sometimes uh, just the the form of the vampire seems so ghastly that, that you cannot even appreciate the romance kind of thing but similarly in the case of lord narsimha dev if one is too caught up in the form there is that prayer of shridhar swami that that you know for a lion baby the lion's form is very protective the she lion's form but for other yes. being it appears very intimidating so yeah. if we can get a go beyond the intimidating appearance of the lord then we can appreciate a lot of a uh, lot of all these emotions and especially the humor otherwise it yeah. just uh, this the form itself can seem quite uh, intimidating and alienating yeah 
um, his his adbuta, which means um, ultimately wonderful in a positive sense, I would say. This is the this is Prahlad's mood. He is he's actually charmed by Nusingadev. He's not he's not at all intimidated. He's charmed. Yeah. So what can appear intimidating to one can appear appear charming. In fact, uh, so is this? Uh, maybe we could conclude on this. This is is this requiring a, like we say premanjana churita bhakti vilochane na. So it's not just the spiritual form that can be seen with the eyes of love, but even when the form manifests in this world, to actually understand that form, we need to have some level of affection or appreciation. Otherwise, uh, mm. we will not we will not pursue rightly. Yeah, exactly. And this is, uh, you could say this is coming back to the subject of deity worship. If we don't have affection for the Lord, uh, then the deity will appear, Prabhupada says, as stone only. And we will not, uh, will not recognize or appreciate that the Lord is present in his deity form. So, as you said, prema, prema anjana churita bhakti vilochanena. Uh, the salve of love smearing the eyes is required. Yes, my Lord. And that's all being done as we read the Bhagavatam and hear about the... the um, the many different forms of the Lord and how they appear and how they how they deal with the demons and how they protect the devotees, then our um, this is all part of the process of preparing the salve, we can say the salve of prema, uh, by which then we can, Prabhupada said, uh, come to see the Lord face to face. Oh, beautiful. So so it's not just that some people have that salve and some don't, but it's, that salve is being prepared by our practice of bhakti. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's true. I just, the, our practice of bhakti and specifically our hearing hearing the Bhagavatam um, in which the Lord is appearing in his many forms. Yeah. Uh, just this last week, I was a uh, participant in the annual American Academy of Religion conference. This is a very large uh, conference of scholars of religion, uh, all, from all over the world, mainly America. And uh, I was part of a panel. Uh, the discussion, the, the theme of the panel, the, ge the general theme was religion in South Asia. The more specific theme was earnestness in South Asian contexts. And I gave a presentation on earnestness in hearing and reading the Bhagavatam. Okay, that's nice. And uh, so, what we are, what I explained in that was, one can speak of what is called religious reading, in contrast to what is called consumer reading. So most people are doing, if they're reading at all. Uh, they're doing consumer reading. But what we are interested in uh, with our literature is religious reading, which means uh, a certain, we want to cultivate a, excuse me, a certain mood of receptivity, of humility, uh, of uh, freedom from envy, of uh, persistence, of, and of course, gradually becoming rasika, as uh, this 
second or third verse says of the Bhagavatam. That's beautiful. Anyway, yeah, anyway of all of this is... Religious reading. You know, I had put it in different terms, but I talked about being a spiritual shopper and being a spiritual seeker. It contrasts that. Mm. But that is more generic terms. But we could talk more in terms of this consumer. This is beautiful, Maharaj. Mm. So, you know, I hope that by your association, I can graduate more from a consumer kind of reading to a religious reading. So, <laughs> and... I I think you opened a lot of uh, vistas for appreciating the Bhagavatam in today's discussion, especially Lord Narasimha Dev. So, should I try to summarize, Maharaj, or you want to add something concluding? This is a beautiful note, actually. The no, please. You're, you're, the ex- you're the expert summarizer. I Go don't ahead. know about that. But, mm. So, um, you know, so we, today we discussed about Narasimha Dev and he started with the story of how Narasimha Dev appeared as a protector so close to the iron curtain and it seems he miraculously expedited his appearance so that he could come and be with you and then since then you have been you were worshipping the deities and then you also uh, written the deity deity worship book and talked about your experiences in Andhra where Narasimha seems to be worship seems to be prominent and there are places like Ahobilam and uh, Simhachalam where Lord Narasimha Dev has historically significant uh, places for worship. Then with respect to Narasimha Dev in the Bhagavatam, you had that brilliant insight that if you had to look at the Lord's equality, it is seen more through how he, he empowers and protects a devotee with equal vision, that is Prahlad. So both Prahlad in his, in his, in his response to the teachings of Shandamarka and his own teachings to Hiranyakashipu manifest that equal disposition and the Lord's equality, another ways in terms of his equal reciprocity. And then uh, we went in the direction of uh, discussing about honor and reputation. So the seven generations protection, one level of understanding it could also be in term. One level is that it opens the door for liberation for seven generations. Another is that a, repu- a devotee gets such a high reputation that others also get high reputation. Then in that connection, I think we talked about honor is contrasted not with say honor is contrasted with whereas shame, both are public, whereas uh, you pride and humility, they are two different virtues. So it's a person who is concerned about honor is not necessarily proud. And a sense of honor can inspire honorable action also. And then we discussed about the rasas and this I think this was one of the best parts about humor in the Bhagavatam. So humor in how Narad Muni you said he'll wink at us if we saw him bowing down to uh, offering respects to Hiranyakashipu. This is the role I have to play. And then how the Lord outsmarts Hiranyakashipu despite all his conditions. So this humor is uh, this humor we need to go beyond the appearances so the Lord's appearance can seem very fearsome. And if you can go beyond that appearance, then uh, we can, the whole world of rasa emotions emerge. And then you also mentioned how there is no tragedy in the Bhagavatam because there is no finality of death. And although Parikshit Maharaj dies, he's liberated by the power of hearing uh, even before his body falls. In that sense, he's a success story. And there might be, there. whenever there is any distress, it's more of pathos rather than tragedy. And that pathos also, we could say, it, it churns the heart and it increases the rasa in different ways. Then we discussed about how there are various rasas in the Bhagavatam with respect to the Narasimha Leela. There is a wonder which uh, even Hiranyakashipu feels. And... Uh, uh, when he sees the form of Narasimha Dev. And of course, there is fear and horror and there is, um, and you talk about humor and there's love, there's affection. And earlier you talked about how there is the form of Narasimha Dev, which is Ugra. And this is Thala, you said, in the Mayapur, which you have, which is even more than Ugra. And then what you have in Germany is more of a Saumya or gentle form with, with uh, Prahalad. So you have Prahalad and Lakshmi both. 
and then we also discussed toward the end about how the uh, when when the lord appears in our tradition there is more like a functional understanding of lord narasimha dev as he purifies our heart so that the radha radha krishna there is place for radha krishna and then in that connection you talked about the two verses from the bhagavatam oh, one is like remove the worldly desires in my heart and the second verse which is even more specific let everybody become pacified so through all the through this prayers the lord's presence in our heart can become manifested and then mm. in the conclusion there was a super point about the difference between uh, consumer reading and religious reading so we can develop that salve of love premanjan churita premanjan by which you can appreciate narasimha dev's leela and ultimately krishna leela also by reading the bhagavatam in a mood of a mood of devotion with humility receptivity freedom from envy and then the lord will manifest in our heart and uh, exactly you are helping us to do that by your association and your sharing your <laughs> insights so thank you very much maharaj any concluding <laughs> shall we shall we conclude with one of prahlad's prayers to nursing yes. a day yes maharaj please <clears throat> Uh, this is verse fifteen of chapter nine. Na ham bi bem ya jita te ati bayan akasya ji var kane trabrukti rabasog gradang strad antra sraja kshaja kshataja keshara shanku karna nihrad abit digibat aribin nagagra, my lord. who are never conquered by anyone i am certainly not afraid of your ferocious mouth and tongue your eyes bright like the sun or your frowning eyebrows i do not fear your sharp pinching teeth your garland of intestines your mane soaked with blood or your high wedge like ears nor do i fear your tumultuous roaring which makes elephants flee to distant places or your nails which are meant to kill your enemies <laughs> so that's prahlad's mood he's he is not afraid it's beautiful thank you very much maharaj for sharing thank your you, prabhu. insights it's wonderful to have thank you you look forward to it next month once again Yes, I think Vamana Dev is next. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Humble obeisances. Shilabhu Padaki Jai. <laughs>